gas behavior is what we're looking at. We'll talk a lot more about these things in class. Right now we're just going to write down um, some information to get us started. Alright, so we're going to start with Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law tells us that volume of a gas is inversely related to its pressure. So, as pressure on a gas decreases, what then will the volume of that gas do? As long as it's in a container that's flexible, if you decrease the amount of pressure that's acting on a gas, the volume of that gas is going to get larger. It's going to increase. Okay, so they are inversely related to one another. Um, as one goes up, the other goes down, or vice versa. So we put this in um, an equation that looks like this. P1V1 equals P2V2, meaning that if you know the initial pressure of a gas, and you know its initial volume, you can change that volume and figure out what the pressure of the gas will be at that new volume. So let's do a problem with this. What is the resulting pressure when 25.3 liters of gas at 3.2 atmospheres is compressed to 15 liters? So what's going to happen to the pressure of this gas if its volume is 25.3 liters to begin with and then we squeeze that gas down to a 15 liter container? What's going to happen to its pressure? Well, if its volume is decreasing, what's its pressure going to do? Its pressure is going to go up. So we should end up getting an answer that is going to be greater than 3.20 atmospheres. So if we look at this formula, um, when 25.3 liters, so this is going to be our V1, this is going to be our V1, this is going to be our P1, and our resulting volume is going to be V2. So we're just going to plug and chug. We're just going to plug this thing in. So we've got 25.3 liters multiplied by, um, oh, I shouldn't confuse you like that. So P1 is 3.20 atmospheres. V1 is 25.3 liters, and that's equal to, we're looking for P2, we don't know it, and V2 is 15.0 liters. So what are we going to do? We're going to multiply these two together, divide by 15.0, and that is going to give us our resulting pressure. All right, so you guys calculate that out. So our next one is known as Charles' Law. So these laws are named after the scientists who, um, who came up with them. One of them is named in, in, uh, in honor of, but not this one. Okay, so volume is directly proportional to temperature. So the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the temperature of that gas. So as the temperature of a gas goes up, the volume of the gas will also do what? It will also go up because they are directly proportional to one another, meaning that as one quantity increases, the other quantity increases, or as one quantity decreases, the other one decreases. Okay, so what can we use? What formula can we use to do these kinds of problems? Well, what we will be looking at is V1 over T1 
is equal to V2 over T2. Okay, so volume one, temperature one, volume two, temperature two. Now the thing about volume and temperature, well temperature specifically, is that the only way these two things can be directly proportional to one another in terms of a linear relationship is if temperature is in the unit of Kelvin. Okay, so let's talk about this unit, Kelvin. And I'm going to show you guys a really interesting graph tomorrow in the class. So the volume of a gas extrapolates to zero when the temperature is zero Kelvin. So if we take some data of various gases and we continue to decrease the temperature, decrease the temperature, decrease the temperature, what we find is that all gases meet at the same origin, which is zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is also known as absolute zero. We've been unable to reach absolute zero on Earth. Those scientists work hard to try to do that. All gas law problems use Kelvin as the unit because that's the only way that we get a linear relationship between volume and temperature is if we use the Kelvin scale. So zero Kelvin is equal to 273 degrees Celsius. So if we want to do some converting from Kelvin and Celsius, if you have a temperature given in Celsius, want to convert that to Kelvin, you're going to add 273 to it. So we've got 25 degrees Celsius here. What is that in Kelvin? It's extremely straightforward. There is nothing tricky about this, people. So we've got um, 35 degrees Celsius, and in order to change that to Kelvin, we are going to add 273. Right, that's all we're going to do. Eight, there we go, 308. So 35 degrees Celsius is 308 Kelvin. Notice we don't use a degree sign when we're recording things in Kelvin. Um, if you've got to go from Kelvin to Celsius, you're going to subtract 273 instead of adding. All gas law problems. Your unit for temperature must be Kelvin. Guy Lussac's law. Guy Lussac's law relates pressure and temperature. The two quantities are directly proportional in terms of gases. So as the temperature of a gas goes up, because they're directly proportional to one another. As the temperature of the gas goes up, the pressure of the gas does what? The pressure of the gas increases as well. And so if we're going to work problems relating pressure and temperature, we are going to utilize a formula that looks like P1 over T1 is equal to P2. over T2. The pressure units don't matter in these cases, in these individual gas laws. You could use TOR, you could use millimeter of mercury, you could use ATM, it doesn't matter. Temperature matters though. These numbers must be in the unit Kelvin. Avogadro's law states 
that as long as you keep temperature and pressure constant, the volume of the gas is going to be directly proportional to the number of moles of gas that you have in the sample. So, because they're directly proportional as moles or the number of particles, the number of pieces of gas molecules that you have, um, as the number of particles increase, the volume of that gas is also going to increase. So, V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. And another thing that this tells us that if we have two samples of gas and both of those samples of gas are at the same temperature, have the same pressure, and have the same volume, we can then deduce from that that we have equal moles of gas in each sample. Okay, this is a very important point. I'm going to say it again. If you have a couple of different samples of gases, and those two samples have the same temperature, the same pressure, and the same volume, then we can deduce that they have equal numbers of moles of gas in that sample. You will see that idea in numerous different contexts. This one, you guys, is the culmination of all of the gas laws. And this is the ideal gas law. And it describes the behavior of gases under ideal conditions. We will only deal with ideal conditions um, here for the majority of the chapter. Now, non-ideal conditions would be if the volume of the gas is very, very tiny. And then some things begin to occur with the gas that don't occur when the gas has plenty of volume to move. So, but we'll deal with that at the end of the chapter. So the ideal gas law here is the thing that is going to relate the behavior of gases mathematically. PV equals nRT. And basically, you guys, if you know this, you can go back and you can set up any of the other relationships that we've talked about. For instance, P1V1 is equal to P2T2. Note, they are on the same side of the equation. P1 over um, P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2, right? They are on opposite sides. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. They are on opposite sides of the equation. And the same thing in terms of relating numbers of moles to pressure and actually numbers of moles to volume as well if we're keeping pressure and temperature constant. Okay, so what do each of these things mean? Well, P is pressure. And in order for this thing to actually work out correctly, We've got to be very careful with our units, and you'll see why at the end. So, P is for pressure, and when we're using the ideal gas equation, we must use ATM as our pressure unit. V is volume, and we must use liters if we are using the ideal gas law, the ideal gas equation. Our unit for volume has to be Otherwise, it doesn't. If we're just using V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, we could use mils, uh, milliliters, or liters, but not here. N is the number of moles. T 
T is temperature in Kelvin, so always, 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 when we are plugging into gas laws, um, we're using our unit K, Kelvin. And last but not least, we have this thing R. And R is the universal gas constant. And its value is 0 0.0821. Note its units, liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin or per Kelvin mole. So that's the reason why we have to be very precise in terms of what units we're plugging into the equation because if they don't match the units of the universal gas constant, um, right, we're not going to have anything canceling out and that universal can gas constant is not going to relate the quantities to one another. So R is like pi. It is a quantity that universally relates one quantity to another. So pi relates the circumference and the diameter of a circle. Am I right? Is that what it does? I'm pretty sure that's what it does. So we always have to use pi in order to relate the, the circumference the diameter of a circle. And it's the same thing with the ideal gas equation. We use R to relate pressure with volume with number of moles and temperature. Mathematically, these laws describe the behavior of gases. Mathematically. Later in this chapter, we will talk about what's really causing, the math isn't causing the gases to behave the way they do. The, the math is just describing the way the gases behave, quantifying it. We don't know why they're behaving the way they do yet, but we will before this chapter is over. All right, that's it.